This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. That's the final expression we're going to sort of deal with. So yeah, what does this sync function look like? Well, what the sync function looks like is obviously this function here. So it's a sine theta over theta. So if you wanted to be able to sketch that, plot theta. Now, sine theta, as we know, looks like, like this. So it goes between 1 and minus 1. And what you're effectively going to do is to multiply that by 1 over theta. So 1 over theta will look something like this. Now, I, I probably haven't got the scaling right. You're going to multiply those two curves together, the blue curve and the red curve. And we'll forget about what happens at um, theta is 0 for the moment. But let's look at what happens when um, for later on. And I hope you can see it's a bit like a decaying sinusoid, right? So I've got a positive bit multiplied by a positive bit. And that's going to give me a waveform like this. And then when the sinusoid goes negative, you're multiplying by 1 over theta, but that's heavily attenuating the signal. And you'll see that it will kind of go on like that forever and ever. If we look at the negative bit, uh, around this region, we've got a negative number by a negative number. So in fact, we get the same shape. And if this function is, in fact, even. And you'll come out with a waveform like that. What happens at theta is 0? OK. What's, what's a good approximation for sine theta when theta is 0, uh, near 0? So we can say sine theta is approximately theta for small theta. OK, uh, it's just a Taylor series expansion. Uh, it's also geometry and all sorts of reasons why that is true. So sinc theta over theta is approximately theta over theta, which equals 1. So that means that these two curves join up and you're 1 at theta equal to 0. So that's what a sine theta over theta curve looks like. The next important thing is when does it cross the zero axis? Well, it crosses the zero axis when the sine part crosses the zero axis. So therefore, well, it, it crosses the axis when theta is a multiple of pi. So we call uh, it's m times pi, where m does not include zero. So m is an integer, but not equal to zero. We'll use that notation. So that gives you the points you cross at. Uh, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and 4 pi, and so on. So we're going to use that to draw our complex coefficients. So we've got x of n is basically sinc of n pi tau over capital T. So the first question is, when does that equal to 0? Okay. So x of n is equal to 0 when uh, n pi tau over capital T is equal to a multiple of pi. So n is the, n, you know, we, so this is going to look a weird expression because both n and m are integers here. So we we'll rearrange that slightly. Uh, the pi is cancel when n is equal to m times capital T divided by tau. So we, let, I'll put some numbers in because at this point it's a bit, bit abstract. So the example that I've given in the handout, I've cho I put some numbers in for t. And I think I've put something like t is 1 second and tau is a fifth of a second. So that capital T over tau, uh, you've got n is 5 times m. So m is an integer not equal uh, to 0. So the times that you're going to cross the axis is when n is equal to 5 and minus 5, 10 and minus 10, 15 and minus 15, and so on. So that's where you get the intercept. OK. So that's how we draw uh, this sink pool. So when we go back to the top of the slide, you'll see that's a, exactly um, what I've got. Uh, I think in this particular example, I set a equal to 1 as well. So what I'm going to do is to plot these Fourier coefficients on a graph. So that nicely plotted graph, which you need to get used to plotting yourself, you can see starts off at, so if a is 1, the amplitude of a 0 coefficient is tau over t, which is 0.2 times 1. So the amplitude of a 0th coefficient is 0 0.2, which is why it's fair. 
And then it follows this curve, but the fifth Fourier coefficient is exactly zero. The tenth coefficient is exactly zero, and so on. And that's it. Now, what we're going to see as we go on to develop the Fourier transform is that we're going to interpret this as a spectrum. So one of the things that I could do is quite, yeah, I've plotted the x-axis as the index of a Fourier coefficient. So remember, NE0 corresponds to a frequency of 0. N is 1, corresponds to a frequency of omega naught in radians per second, where omega naught was uh, 2 pi divided by t, and t is equal to 1, so it's just 2 pi. N is 2, corresponds to 4 pi, 3, 6 pi. So the frequency at which uh, you're, you, you, you go to 0 is that a frequency of omega is equal to 10 pi. So really what I can sort of interpret this is actually being a frequency axis where I've only got discrete frequencies that exist. So we've talked about what discrete time signals are. This is ba basically a discrete frequency signal. Um, we've turned a continuous time periodic signal, so something that exists for every increment in time, into a signal that in a frequency domain only has discrete values. That's quite important. Yep. These, yeah, yeah, it's not like harmonic, they're exactly harmonics. That's exactly what it is. Uh, so it's just a visual way of representing it. So I know a lot of Fourier series is developed just as maths on a bit of paper and you write down the Fourier coefficients. But once you start plotting them and viewing it as a spectrum and viewing how, how it looks. So um, if we did that, so if I drew another axis on here and I now call this frequ um, frequency omega, so this frequency is omega is 2 pi, this is omega is 10 pi. We can now actually start doing some wonderful stuff, such as follows, uh, to give you some motivation. Let's say I've got I don't know, a copper cable, telephone cable, and I model that copper cable using your resistors and capacitors. And let's say that we model it as basically a first order filter. So that means that up until a certain frequency, you don't attenuate the signal and then you drop off at 20 dBs per decade. Okay, let's say that we want to transmit our rectangular pulse, which is at the top of this diagram, through that copper cable, and we know that the 3 decibel point of our copper cable is at 20 kilohertz, for example. Then we can work out what the maximum, because we now know that um, the bulk of a frequency content is actually in this range here, up to 10, 10 pi. You know, I need, probably need to put some numbers in here. But I could actually work out what the shortest period of this waveform could be. I could work out the maximum frequency. But I could transmit down this copper cable before the signal components start disappearing. So when we start putting this signal through a channel, such as a copper cable, visualizing the spectrum in this way becomes very, very important. Okay? So what you can start doing is working out what's the maximum bandwidth. You can, you know, this rectangular signal is, is basically... Imagine it's a digital signal that you're trying to transmit down copper cable. You can now start to think about what's the maximum bit rate I can transmit down this cable, which might sort of explain why, for example, uh, data rates on old telephone cables were limited to 2 megabits per second. So you can do some reverse engineering there, if that is of interest to you. And it, it, it certainly is of interest because, just a, I'll have to watch your time, but just as a quick aside, I always think everyone says, um, Netflix, great, we can download Ultra HD, 4K movies, Netflix, it's fine. No one's going to be buying Blu-rays in five years. This is a sort of common argument you see in the press. I don't know what you think. So they're trying to develop a 4K Blu-ray format. Why bother, they say. We can just transmit it. You can download it um, via, your, via the web. And, yeah, you can when you've got a good connection and you probably live in a city. Now go out to someone who lives in the country and they've got an incredibly slow connection because basically they've got like 50 miles of copper cable to get to them and I think you'll find that they will struggle to be downloading their 4K, 3, 3D, 60 frames per second movie via Netflix. So there's a lot of challenges still there to do and in fact if everyone in the country started downloading 4K uh, ultra high definition there's, the infrastructure is not there to do it so in fact there is still, I believe, that we'll see Blu-rays for at least another 10-15 years. But it's up to you. You're, you could be working in companies, telecoms companies, which are going to try and address these challenges of delivering incredibly high volume data across existing networks. Okay.
Because we can't be digging up the roads all the time and putting in fibres. It's bad enough in Edinburgh as it is, don't you think? So just as a, a comment before I get on to summary slide 11, is, is that we should, always view, we should always view complex Fourier coefficients as complex numbers. And that means that in general, they are going to be complex value. Now, for the rectangular pulse I've given, because of its symmetric about zero, then, in fact, there are no sign terms, so there's actually there's no, re, um, there's no imaginary component. And so we've ended up with a real spectrum here because of complex coefficients are all real values. But in general, they're not going to be. And so therefore, what you do, if you've got a complex number, you, there are a variety of ways of plotting complex numbers, polar coordinate systems, you get nice smooth arcs. Um, or you can just do the simple approach, which is to plot the magnitude on one diagram and the phase in another diagram. So we're going to think about this, this graph here, and we're going to plot the magnitude. So that gives us a diagram at the top of page 11. And I have no idea why I've stretched it vertically, but it should really be the same size. But that's the magnitude. So all the negative components become positive components. In general, if you're trying to plot x magnitude of x of n, then that's going to be a complex number, and it's going to be uh, the square root of a real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. But now we have to plot the phase. So the phase uh, is the inverse tan of the imaginary part over the real part. So how on earth do you plot the phase of a signal that we've got here? So the way I like to view it is just to draw, um, draw numbers in the, com in the complex plane itself. So draw real versus imaginary. Draw yourself a circle, and we'll think about where the values are. So for this particular problem, I've either got positive values or negative values. So I'm either on a real axis on a positive real axis, where the phase is zero. That angle there is zero degrees. Or I'm on a negative real axis, and the phase is either plus pi, and we're, I'm going to define the phase as basically, if you go anti-clockwise as being a positive phase, and if you go clockwise as a negative phase. Now, it, what's interesting is either you can define a phase as plus pi or minus pi, which is interesting. Now, one of the properties that we're going to see of Fourier coefficients, which if you haven't already guessed, is that for a real signal in the time domain, the complex coefficients are actually complex conjugates. That gives us a bit of a dilemma. If I choose, for example, a positive frequency component and the signal is negative, if I assign to it a phase of plus pi, if I let, then look at the corresponding negative component, that's got to have an opposite phase of minus pi and vice versa because the spectrum is conjugate symmetric. Conjugate symmetric means magnitude is the same, but the phase is different. So the convention is as follows. I've chosen for positive frequency components. If, you're, if you've got a negative value, a negative real value, you choose the phase as being minus pi. Or I've drawn it in degrees there. So that's at minus 180. And uh, if you're a negative component, we choose the phase as being plus pi. It's a completely arbitrary decision. Doesn't matter which way you choose it. Uh, once you've done it, stick with it. The other issue that you're going to have with phase plots, uh, and there's a tutorial question on this, and it will make you think, is that phases really, angles, only really go between 0 and 360. Now, we're going to see examples where you can come out with phases that are 720 degrees. But if you don't try and plot that in MATLAB, you'll, you'll end up with some problems, because MATLAB will do what's called phase wrapping. And if something is outside a region of minus 180 to plus 180, it will add 360 degrees to it. So what does that mean? It means minus 181 degrees will come out as 179 degrees, because you've added 360 to it to get it in the correct range. That's called phase wrapping. So beware phase wrapping. There's a, a, a very tough question in the tutorial sheet, which basically what you do is you have this rectangular pulse, but you delay it. And as we see, a delay corresponds to addition of a linear phase shift. And so you have to add on to this, this curve here a gradient, and then you have to phase wrap it. And that's quite a challenging question to do that part, but it's well worth having a, a go at. Let's just go back. Bef before 
if I want to relate the complex Fourier coefficients to the trigonometric Fourier coefficients, I had this relationship at the top. But I can do a little trick, and you can follow this trick and read it in your own time. But basically, if I define, I've got these coefficients. The question is, um, if n is minus 10, uh, you'll notice that, so I've got n is minus 10, then in fact this coefficient here is a of minus minus 10, which is a of 10. So what I'll do is a mapping where I say, define a of n is a of minus n. Um, for the cosine terms, a of 10 is a of minus 10. And you similarly, you do, but for b of n, you set b of n is minus b of minus n. What it allows you to do is to combine these three equations together to come out with this single equation. So that's a single relationship between a trigonometric and a, a Fourier. So one of the questions in the examples paper gets you to work out the trigonometric Fourier series and then to derive a complex one from it, and vice versa. Uh, but from this equation here, complex conjugate symmetry arises directly. And as I've already said on my handout, Fourier coefficients and magnitude is symmetric. In other words, the magnitude of x of minus n, x of minus 10, the magnitude of is the magnitude of x of plus 10. But the phase is odd symmetry. That's what complex conjugate symmetry does. So that allows you to do a lot more of tu the tutorial sheet. So have fun over the weekend working on it. And I'll see you next Tuesday. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.